Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, the 20th chapter of Luke, verses 41 through 44, if you want to turn there while we're talking. And um, when we look at this section, we need to have some context because this has been a large portion of Scripture that's all sort of run together. And so I want us to look back over the last few chapters and sort of build a timeline when we're coming to this part because this uh, section of Scripture is sort of, I don't want to call it obscure, but it's sort of different and it's... Uh, from a Western culture, we're going to look into something a little, a little unique. So when we, uh, when we start here, uh, let's take a look and uh, think back to uh, how we got to this point. And that is that um, we've seen Jesus making his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. This will be his finest, final Passover. And so he's been on this journey through the last few chapters. Along the way, uh, he's met Zacchaeus and he's met the rich young ruler. And in between those two, we have uh, the story of blind Bartimaeus, who was uh, a blind man that Jesus gave his uh, sight to, and he called him Jesus, son of David. And we want to remember that because this is going to come up in this section of Scripture. When Jesus finally got to uh, Jerusalem, he uh, found that the temple had become uh, a marketplace, and it had not become a place for worship. But as we read and studied, it had become just a, a marketplace where people were overcharging and were, were um, violating the, the temple. And Jesus came in and he made whips and he cleansed the temple. We read how he went in, to turn the tables over, whipped people out of there, and, uh, and cleansed it. And uh, once he did that, then he became a regular fixture in the temple and was teaching. We see at the beginning of uh, chapter 20 how his authority is challenged, and they come to him and say, by whose authority do you preach? And he says, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. And he says, uh, who was John the Baptist from? And so they couldn't answer. And so he said, well, you're not going to answer my question. I'm not going to answer yours. This whole setup uh, in this chapter then leads to this point where there's always these gotcha questions that they're trying to ask. Uh, Jesus, uh, during that time, shares the, uh, the parable of the wicked talents, I mean the wicked tenants, sorry, and um, uh, how that uh, they beat his son and uh, later retribution occurred on them. And then they had the question where they tried to trick him about Caesar, and we studied that two weeks ago, and uh, where he held up the money and says, give to Caesar what Caesar's. And then last week... Uh, we had with the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. And as Sean said, that's why they're sad, you see. So the, they, um, they don't believe, I was listening. They don't believe, <laughs> they don't believe in the resurrection. And so uh, they ask this question about the resurrection and they bring up this uh, sort of wild story about a seven a woman who marries seven brothers in a row and then they take an obscure uh, scripture from the Old Testament and they say, you know, okay, so who, who's he going to be with in heaven? And so uh, Jesus' answer uh, silenced the Sadducees and made the Pharisees and the scribes extremely happy. And uh, once Jesus makes a group of people happy, he then sees fit to make them unhappy by sharing another truth. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, in this section, we're going to read. So let's take a look at uh, Mark 20, verses 41 through 40. I'm sorry, Luke 20. And it says, But he said to them, How can they say that Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds to your word in this section of scripture, Lord. There's, there's something for every person in here. And we pray that you would uh, just help my words to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. So when reading a, a section of scripture like this, it's sort of without any context. We're not quite sure what he's trying to get at. And so when we look at it, we figure out how do we find an objective when we study this, this section of Scripture? How are we trying to find the point that he's trying to get across? So the point I came up with, I looked at commentaries, I watched a couple other pastors, and nobody really had anything. So um, I think what we can get out of this, and I think you would agree after we're done, is that every person must decide how to react to Christ's claim uh, that, of the Messiah. 
because there's only two options. We can either accept him or reject him. And I think we'll, this will be clear by the end of the, of the section that that's what Jesus' point was. So in verse 41, we see that Christ is asking a probing question. The, um, like I said, they had just finished trying to trick him and asking all these weird questions. And so he comes on with, I won't say it's weird because it's Jesus, but it, uh, an unusual question we would look at and say, uh, how, how does that, <clears throat> what does that actually mean? Um, after Jesus, like I said, had cleansed the temple, he was now a regular fixture at the temple. And the common people loved him. They were coming and they were uh, listening to him. Uh, they couldn't, not everybody could go into the inner part of the temple, but in the common area, almost everybody could go in. And he was teaching and sharing the gospel and teaching with people there. In this section, um, when he asks this question, this, when I say it's a, a weird, uh, it's weird for us in, in Western culture, this was a typical method that, uh, that was used by Jewish leaders to ask questions. They would ask something from one point and then to another point that was radically different and then try and find something in the middle to prove, to get the answer. And so they would, you know, we've all heard and seen people that like to argue and, you know, ask moral questions or can God make a rock so big he can't pick it up, that kind of thing. And so that's how they would use these uh, questions to sort of uh, define and to, to get their, um, their theology. And like I said, we just saw um, when we t last week uh, the, the question about the seven, the seven husbands. Um, if you can think, uh, some of you are in high school, maybe some of you have been out a long time, but if you think about high school and sort of how in the lunchroom you have a group of people that fit together, right? You have the jocks in one section and then maybe the computer kids in another section and then emo kids and you have different groups around. And so you can think of this section of scripture in that same way. Think of while Jesus is teaching, you've got the Pharisees in one section and they're over there and they're whispering to each other and they're trying to come up with questions to trick Jesus and to trip him up. That's their goal because the people are liking them and they're starting to understand what he's saying and follow him. And this is, uh, this is very disconcerting to, to, the, uh, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders because they could lose their power this way. So you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes are part of the Pharisees, some of them, and it's these groups, and so they're all kind of huddling together. They've come with that question, and now Jesus uh, says, okay, now my turn to ask a question. Uh, to explain the scripture, Luke is uh, very forthright, just boom, boom, boom. And uh, this story is told in two other gospels, in Mark and Matthew, and we're gonna look at those. So if you wanna turn to Mark, 12, 36 through 37. On your Bible app or in your Bible, or it'll be on the screen here. And it says, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say to the Christ, uh, can the, sorry, the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David. David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself called him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard this and were glad. Uh, the next ver verse we're going to skip around to is Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And when we read Matthew, Matthew... Uh, was a very, uh, wrote his gospel uh, with the Jewish people in mind. So everything that he writes is in the perspective of helping to convert uh, people from the nation of Israel. So in this section, he's gonna provide more information which helps us gain even more context. So Matthew 22, 41 through 46. It says, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David, which if you remember, we heard from the blind man. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? 
Verse 46 says that no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Jewish people were expecting a, uh, another King David, a, a David Jr., if you will, or someone that would come in, in a, from an earthly uh, and reestablish Israel as an earthly kingdom. They wanted uh, this person, they believed that this person would come in, become the new Messiah, and he would overthrow the Roman Empire and reestablish Israel as the dominant religion and the dominant nation on the world. Jesus uses this question and this scripture to reframe the thinking and to challenge their thinking on what the Messiah would actually be and who he would be. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at, if you'll turn with me, to Psalm 110.1. This is the scripture that is used by Jesus uh, when he's talking to them. It's a quick scripture, and it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. When we look at this, uh, as Christians, we don't like to point one piece of scripture out uh, and make theology on it, but when Jesus does it, we're okay with it. So uh, we can look at this and say, okay, Jesus is trying to get a point across here, right? It's more than just he's trying to make a, 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 a point. There's something happening here. So when we look at Psalm 110.1, we see that it was written by David. Uh, many of the Psalms were written by David, but many were not. The importance of this Psalm uh, and the fact that it's written by David is because it uh, goes exactly to the point that David is making about this line of succession. Uh, David uh, had wanted to build the temple, and God had told him no, but God uh, made a covenant with him that the Messiah would be born from uh, the line of David. David, however, had not been in power for over a thousand years. After Solomon, uh, which was his line, and then he had Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they split the, the nation of Israel, and then Israel just went, went horribly wrong. Both sides went bad. And we know the history of that if, you, if you've read the Old Testament. So when we look at this section, we have two lords in here. So the Lord says to my Lord. So God the Father is talking to God the Messiah, right? So we know that's Jesus. At this time, they understand it to be the Messiah. They're not convinced it's Jesus, and they have a different perspective on it. So Christ uses this scripture to prove who he is. Uh, by reading this, and the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, that uh, means that uh, it is equated with God. So God and Jesus are the same. That's the point that he's making here. He's equating both of these two with equal status as God. An interesting note that I came across while studying this is on the term footstool. And I, I've, I've seen that, and we've probably all heard this term, and I didn't know it until uh, doing some research on it. But that, in, in the old days, when you uh, defeated your enemy, you would bring them in and the rest of their court, and the king would actually sit on his throne and put his legs up on the, and use them as an actual footstool. And this was uh, to grade them, degrade them, and humiliate them, and to um, prove that peace had come because the enemy had been vanquished. And we'll show you how you're vanquished. I put my feet on you. You can't get much lower of, a, of an insult than that. So we don't say that this is an insult in this case, but it gives you know, an idea of what uh, the point that is trying to be committed here is that the enemy has been vanquished. By using the words, my Lord, David is speaking through the Holy Spirit, and he's showing what has been revealed to him through and by the Holy Spirit. So he gets an understanding that God and the Messiah, which we know is Jesus, are equal. Uh, my Lord, who he's talking about here, the Lord says to my Lord, is... Um, from the line of David. And so it uh, proves the point that uh, the, the lineage that uh, God had promised to David and it is being fulfilled through Jesus. David is saying that the Messiah uh, from his line that will come will be greater than David. 
It will be greater than him and will be equal with God. He wouldn't call his son my Lord because he would be above him, right? If we have a child and our child becomes president, we still say, hey, Joe, or hey, Donald, right? Uh, we don't call him, hey, Mr. President, and say to him, we would call him if they're our kid, we're going to call him. Because we have an understanding that they're our child, they come from us. The Messiah is equal with God and is not a man. In verse 43, uh, the Jewish leaders believed that the Messiah would come from David. So they had that understanding that, that David would come from, I mean the Messiah would come from David's line. Jesus was recognized and called the son of David. We saw that at the beginning when we were talking about Bartimaeus. We saw that six weeks ago or so. So there was an understanding that the common people had and that people had that it was known that he came from that lineage. Uh, the other gospels also use the same terms. Uh, the Gospels provide his lineage to show that Jesus was a descendant of David. So when we look at Matthew specifically, we can see the entire line of the world is, up to that point, is laid out with the, with the uh, fathers and sons and the, and the mothers involved. And so that shows that Jesus came from David. Christ's point is to show that he is God incarnate and is on earth and among the people. So his whole point in, in discussing this is to, like I said, reframe the context of, of the conversation from it being a man to it being God on earth. So he's making everybody rethink what they think the coming Messiah will be. Jesus knows his plan is to die and not establish uh, an earthly kingdom, but to establish a spiritual kingdom. Others won't know that. We know that now looking back, but at the time, like I said, they were expecting an earthly kingdom. Uh, a couple of notes in the section on Mark where it says that the, the people heard him and they were glad. There's two prevailing different views on what that actually means. <laughs> One is that um, it would appear that uh, perhaps the people were excited that they had shut the uh, Pharisees up and the Sadducees up because it had been gotcha, 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 and they were finally happy to see a regular person come through and uh, quiet them up and say, hey, he's one of our guys. That's one theory. And the other is that it could just mean that uh, the crowd was happy with Jesus' teaching in general. So we're not sure specifically which one, but either of those makes sense in the context. And we do know that the people were happy that uh, Christ was teaching to everybody and it opened up uh, the temple for everybody to be in. In, uh, in this Matthew scripture, in verse 46, it says, and no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. When we look at that scripture, we know that what, that does not mean that nobody asked him any more questions because we read the disciples did. What he's talking about in the scriptures from then on until Jesus is brought before the, the tribunal after being betrayed, is that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes didn't ask him any more questions. They'd, they'd had their fill, they'd been humiliated in public, and they had moved on. So the regular people still ask him, so we see the disciples asking questions, that kind of thing. So as we've um, reviewed this, and I think it's pretty clear that uh, God is claiming that he is the Messiah, or Jesus is claiming that he's the Messiah, and that um, the Messiah is equal with God. And so Jesus, like I said, has reframed this idea. And so it's, it's pretty clear. Before and after these times, he's admitted and stated that he's, he's the Messiah to come. So we have, a, we have one of two choices. Uh, we can either say that he's a man, and you might say he's a good man, or he was a nut, whatever you can say, and you can reject him. And the other choice is that you have to say, oh, okay, I believe what he said and uh, accept him. He should be worshiped and we should uh, repent, turn our lives from him, to him, sorry. So in finding some application for this scripture, what are some things that we can do uh, in light of reading this? 
And I think um, if you're a Christian, one of the things you can do is to read and study the Old Testament. The Old Testament uh, always points towards man's need for salvation and a coming savior. And we find uh, through the Old Testament as we read the stories, we see through Genesis and all these other stories that man is, man is not good, man is evil, right? And they need somebody to redeem them. And it's building towards the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus coming to save them and save the world. So it's important when we take time to read the Old Testament and look at those stories and see how we can study them and how they can um, uh, reinforce our faith in saying, ah, we, we made a good decision in following Christ. He's our Savior. Here's what the Old Testament points to. Uh, the second application is if you're not a follower of Christ, uh, you must decide who Jesus is. Uh, if he is who the Old Testament pointed out to be, then we need to repent and turn away. Uh, this is not meant to scare anybody because I'm totally opposed to doing hellfire and brimstone talks, but the world is nutty right now, and a lot of crazy things are happening, right? There's shootings, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. So when we think of questions like this, we need to make a decision and go forward with what we decide. If we, if, if we want to believe or we're curious about Christ, then we need to make the decision to, be, uh, to turn towards him and to repent and to live how he wants. If we reject, then we're, you know, we're on our own and we hope for the best. But because uh, times are, are crazy right now, I would not put off the decision. I think it's important to make a decision. We've, we've studied this and we heard, and it's pretty plain that, that um, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, if you want to, like I said, that's your decision how you want to follow. But if you have any questions about that or you don't quite believe it or you're not sure what to make of everything, you can talk to myself or pastors, uh, Marty or Pastor Sean, one of the elders, one of the deacons. Uh, we'd all be happy to help uh, and let you know how Christ has changed our lives and how we've, um, how we've changed to become followers of him. Uh, when, we, when we look at what Christ has done, uh, in our lives as Christians, and here specifically at Live Oak, um, we uh, look at the communion table. Here at Live Oak, we do communion every week. We feel that it's important that we have a, day, a weekly reminder of Jesus and the fact that he uh, was beat and that he uh, bled and died for our sins. And so we want to uh, do this in remembrance of him when we came. If you're, uh, when we come to the table. If you're not a believer, we ask that you just sit and wait, and then we hope you become a believer and ask somebody. We'd be happy to help you. But uh, again, the communion is for, for the believers, and it is uh, to reinforce and to remember the importance because this whole scripture comes down, the whole Bible comes down to Jesus uh, dying on the cross and uh, being raised from the dead for our sins. So uh, we owe... When we do communion, we come get it, and then we go back. You can do it with your family or friends, or if you want to take it alone, however you want. But we do ask that you take some time in prayer before we, um, before we take communion, and, uh, and then after that, we'll continue. So let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for scriptures that um, may seem confusing at the beginning, but then once you explain to us, uh, it's wonderful to hear your plan and to see that you've uh, had a plan for us all through it, uh, the world. And we pray that you would uh, help us to uh, bring to mind, Lord, any sins or things we need to repent for so that we might uh, come before you clean before the table. We're grateful for your word and we love you. Amen.